Hey, it's Dave. Welcome. Today I'm joined by Andre Mouliard. He is the creator, uh, one of the creators of GPT for All. It's basically a large language model, a GPT model that lets you run it on your MacBook Air locally without an internet connection. Yesterday I downloaded the project from GitHub, ran it on my computer. It was amazing. Um, I was blown away, showed it to my wife and kids. I'm like, look, entire AI agent on your computer without the internet. Um, incredible stuff. I wanted to bring Andre on the show, talk about what he's done, but more importantly, take a step back. What's going on with AI in general? Um, what's happening over the past several months? How can those people who aren't necessarily directly in the field technically, how can they understand right, um, things happening? Because th things are happening so fast right now. So Andre, welcome to the show. Um, how are you doing? Hey, Dave, thank you. Uh, doing great. Excited to get some sleep this weekend after a fun weekend of hacking last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, um, yeah. I mean, how has it been? Like yesterday you released this GitHub model. How has the reaction been uh, yeah, yeah. downloading yeah, so, this thing and trying yeah, it so out? We released, um, was it Tuesday of this week? And uh, immediately, like, it just popped off, uh, which was kind of surprising to us. Uh, we didn't think we'd have this sort of a, that big of a reaction to it. Uh, probably the biggest reason that uh, it's gotten so much traction and so many people started playing with it was because we went, honestly, like, we spent an extra 10 minutes to make it really easy to use by pre-compiling everything you need to run it locally, mm -hmm. as opposed to you having to, like, you know how to code to, like, compile something so you can run it. Um, and by just releasing the model with the actual little piece of software to run it, everyone was able to just quickly get started and actually play with it, which is why people like it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell me the genesis of this project. How, how did you guys come up with this idea and who was involved and how long did it take you guys to pull it off? Yeah, yeah. So basically about a week and a half ago, um, I was like sitting and pondering the state of uh, like AI research, um, how it relates to what's happening in industry with AI. Uh, like thinking about OpenAI's recent uh, GPT-4 paper that was released that lacked a method section, the section of the paper that tells you like how they did it and like what you can do to somehow begin like reproducing their work. And I was sort of thinking about all these things in context and realizing that a lot of people think that uh, these like chatbots that exist out there are sort of these like in the cloud objects that are only accessible to like very few big pocketed organizations. And the only way to reach them is to send HTTP requests to this like cloud and then you get responses back. Yeah. Um, I had previously worked at a company where we trained these like uh, large language models before. So I knew a little bit how, how, how to get started. It wasn't that big of a, big of a difficulty. And um, I got one of uh, the interns who worked with us last summer. He's actually a high school student. I was like, hey, this could be a high impact thing. Uh, you should start collecting data from OpenAI if you can do it. Um, so uh, we kind of looked at the terms of use. Uh, everything seemed kosher in terms of the actual like collecting data from it. If you wanted to train something that's like uh, non-commercial, so we're like, okay, let's do it. Um, and over the course of about a week, we collected a million input-output generation pairs from Chat GPT uh, uh, Turbo, uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo uh, is the mm -hmm. model, um, and it costs about uh, 0.002 cents per every thousand sort of like words that it generates. So at the end, it costs about like 500 bucks to make it uh, mm -hmm. to get all the outputs. And so we, we had sort of like a pre-configured machine learning pipeline we could feed these uh, feed these um, these prompt generations into, and then out comes this model that you can then chat with. Um, so that that actual um, like getting the data was really the hard part uh, because no one really cared about working on this. Um, it was just me and like basically the high school student who like went went, went, went in and took the project by the wheels and started working on it. Um, and then when I told one of my friends uh, Zach that uh, I had this data set. And he, he got very interested. Zach's a machine learning engineer. Uh, he is like, he's in the weeds of like the AI world right now, uh, training models daily. Uh, really good machine learning engineer, by the way. Um, and he was like, I, ha I was like, I have this data set. He's like, well, I've worked on like tangent things very recently. We're like, let's put one plus one equals two together. Over the weekend, we went, uh, spent a bunch of time hacking, like waking up at 2 a.m. to kick off the models while they were, while they were dying, just like didn't sleep at all this weekend. Um, and then out, come, out of the oven popped out this like model that mm -hmm. we, I remember we were sitting there together when we first got the, the first sample, the first generation out of the model. Um, and we gave it like a trick question. The trick question was like, it was a coding question. We were like, hey, this is a piece of code that reverses a string. And then we gave it a code that prints the length of a string. We were like, why doesn't my code work? And then the a model correctly outputted that like, hey, you're trying to trick me. This is what the code actually does. And, they, and we just like, we just like stood up at each other like in awe, like, oh my God, <laughs> it was great. Uh -huh. um, anyways, uh, so we had this thing. Um, we were like, we should release this, we should release it soon um, uh, because 
the world eats they have access to it but also i think a lot of p- other people at the same similar time at the like end of last week were sort of thinking about these same ideas what if mm-hmm. you were to take a bunch of generations uh from like a uh, llm api like open ai and then train a model on their output so we like kind of wanted to um like a get there first but also just like we wanted to make sure we were making something that was like high quality too so we put in some time to make sure that the data was clean that's sort of a big part of the project that we made that we went in and made sure that the data we were training the model on was very clean um and then about monday we realized there's like a really cool library um called uh llama c plus plus and llama c plus plus is this library that this like pro hacker uh georgie made uh that lets you take one of these seven billion parameter neural networks and then quantize it it's like it's kind of like this compilation process so that such that the model can run on your computer's cpu so like on your m1 mac or like on an intel cpu and this allows you to then usually these large language models need a gpu to run them this allows you to without a gpu be able to just like on your bare metal machine like sample this like godlike object it's 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 pretty sick um and we, we got it running it worked well we were like okay let's just put it out there uh see what happens we were kind of tired a little bit like uh, we're just like, kind of done with the project. It was like, it was fun, but we got no sleep. Uh, we put it out there and then just like within like 10 minutes, the whole thing blew up. And immediately, like, I think within the first 24 hours, we got like 5,000 stars on GitHub, um, went over, over Twitter. I think there's a couple of YouTube videos out already on it. And so we didn't really anticipate the reaction, uh, probably because we went in and well made a, uh, like a, a version that anyone can run locally. Uh, that, yeah. that's, that's sort of the big step that nobody else really did, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that, it's great. I mean, yeah, you guys, yeah, it's um, it, the accessibility, right, of downloading it, making it super simple running. So I've got this running on my terminal on my MacBook Air here. Yep. And um, we'll go ahead and um, I'll shoot it uh, a question. Why does it rain? And so the cool thing is this is not accessing the Internet at all, right? This is just purely yep. on your local machine. Um, we could say what what is air? Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is um this is incredible. Um, what's the most important three things to do if stranded on a deserted island? I kept on thinking, like, this, this would be great to have in the wilderness or something, you know, <laughs> just without an internet connection. If you're just stuck, um, find fresh water, build a shelter pump without a palm. Okay. Yeah. Natural materials. Cool. Any cool prompts that you've kind of run across um, in your time just um, running this thing? So over the weekend, mm-hmm. when we were building this, like, our benchmark was the model that we sort of, the, the correct term for this for this data collection is called distil- like data collection and training is called model distillation. So you take the outputs of the mm. chat GPT model and then you train your own model. Um, so our sort of benchmark the whole time while we were working on it this weekend was like, how does how good does it do compared to chat GPT? Um, mm-hmm. And we were sort of a little bit dismayed throughout the weekend because like we were giving it all these hard problems and hard prompts and yeah. it just like couldn't really uh, produce anything that we, 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 we thought was like at the level that ChatGPT has. Um, but then once we were actually released it out, what was cool is that a lot of people found it ve- found it had very high utility for tests like this, like asking it sort of a generic English language questions, getting a little bit of creativity out. Um, yeah. And then the whole, the, whole, the whole idea of just like, it exists locally, you're not hitting some sort of API is the, uh, is, 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 is the thing that um, really, like, really made it catchy. Um, I think one of, the, one of the coolest sort of prompts that you could give it um, is try to talk to it like it's an actual agent. Um, mm-hmm. That's when you can start seeing a little bit of, the, of, of its cracks. For, for instance, like it'll, it'll it'll do a lot of hallucination. For example, mm-hmm. um, the, one of the other things that you uh, will notice with this model is that if you ask it to do something like heinous, so if you ask it to do something bad, um, since it's trained on Chat GPT outputs, which uh, that Chat GPT model was sort of designed and trained in such a manner where it wouldn't answer with it wouldn't allow you, it wouldn't tell you how to do bad things. This model mm-hmm. inherited some of those properties. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, and so, like one one of those one of those downfalls down, downfalls, for example, is like if you ask it to be like too political, sometimes it won't actually respond. For example, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, so some people were voicing concerns. There you go. <laughs> oh, you can't give financial advice. So where does this come from? Yeah. If, there, so, if it wasn't aligned, there wasn't alignment or 
Yeah, yeah. Let me. So let me, this this requires, I think, jumping back to 2017. <laughs> so mm-hmm. a long, long time ago, uh, which feels like a long, long time ago, but in the AI world has been like a second. Um, mm-hmm. There came out this machine learning, uh, like deep learning architecture called the transformer. You've probably, you've probably seen this word kind of uh, um, around the internet. And the transformer architecture is this way to, is this, is this um, deep learning model, which if you train it on a bunch of data, uh, it can learn to perform many, many tasks on unstructured data modalities. So like images, text, mm-hmm. uh, audio. But the model was first released actually as the best like state of the art system to do machine translation. So like you give it a uh, piece of text and then it outputs piece of text, piece of pieces of text out. What people realized within about a year or two is that if you take these models and you train them on internet set size, internet size data sets. So for instance, like all of common crawl, or if you curate it a little bit and make something like the pile, uh, which is another one of these data sets that large language models are pre-trained on, um, it learns properties about the world. Um, so that was like 20, like 2020, 2021. And what was kind of crazy is then people were realized if you take these large models, you can begin giving them instructions. This is when the word prompting came out mm-hmm. and it will follow us. It wouldn't just generate you like, like given a web page, continue generating on the text, of the web page that it uh, that it was trained on. If you gave it an instruction, it would sometimes follow your instruction. Um, mm-hmm. And people began thinking, hey, can I design data sets where I can keep training these models on them, where it would learn to follow instructions even better, for example. Um, and this was sort of one of the big things that um, the original GPT-3 paper did, this was like back in 2020, is that they trained one of these large language models in like an internet, an internet full of data. And then when they evaluated it, they, ch- they evaluated it on tasks that asked it to do instructions. For instance, like tell me the similarity of like two sentences. And it was able to do this really, really well. This is sort of proof to the research community that this is a viable thing that people should care about looking at. Because before this, nobody really thought of, uh, thought of, nobody really thought of text as this sort of like universal interface for like solving problems with computers. Like you put a piece of text mm-hmm. in and the computer gives you a, like, a, like a paragraph out that can solve your problem. Um, and sort of like fast forwarding a little bit, there's like all these other developments that came around uh, where you can take, make these mo- take these like instruction tuned models. So these models that uh, you can give it a prompt and it'll give you an output and you can align them to uh, act like chatbots, for example. So sort of the big thing that came out of the string series of chatbots we've seen over the last year and then sort of, I guess, what culminated in chat GPT is that they use these methods that allowed you to create a chatbot system that was not only assistant-like, as in like you could tell it to make you a story and then it would give you an output. What it would then do is they could configure the training in such a manner where it would align to like moral values that humans have. So it would learn to say like, hey, if you want advice about financial things like we saw previously, it wouldn't do that for you. It'll, it'll, it'll give this hesitating response. And that's why you see that with chat GPT. Um, and so kind of the cool thing with this, with this model, GPT for all, is that it inherits some of those properties from distillation. Um, Got it. Is it yeah. inheriting through the training that you guys did because exactly. you did so many prompts exactly. and responses that exactly. some of those responses from chat GPT has that type of characteristic. Exactly. Like okay. GPT for all has in, in its parameter space has some mm-hmm. knowledge about what are the bad things it shouldn't talk about. Yeah. And then it learns to sort of hesitate in, in answering of those things. For instance, if you were asked to do something racist, it would refuse. Got it. Um, uh, someone w- or my wife was like, Hey, is this a uh, AI stealing any information or are there should there i'm like oh this is just running on terminal it's probably not doing anything like can you uh kind of address any of those security concerns people might have like is there something in the back end you know happening yeah 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 so i mean if you sandbox this it'll work exactly the same it doesn't access Mm -hmm. anything apart from uh like like you the file that you run your computer when you download it spins up the model on your machine lets you play with it and it does not access anything outside from the model what what happens under the hood is when you put in a piece of text it gets put into the model and then the model generates out the next most likely word. And then it takes the next most likely word, takes the piece of text you put in and generates out the next most likely word. And that's why you're seeing this like bit by bit being generated out. That's, that's, that's the whole process end to end. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the thing that we've been really careful for is like, as, this, as, the, as the sort of popularity of this repository has grown, uh, a lot of people have been trying to like uh, ease the costs of like, like maintaining this thing. So this model is about four gigabytes in size. I actually just, and we, uh, we uploaded it to this storage medium called Amazon Sim- Simple Storage Service S3, um, which is actually not good for distributing large files um, to the whole world. And we actually checked this morning and we accidentally spent $2,000 on giving this model out to people. 
Uh, okay. So that was that, that was a little bit bad, but like it's okay. P people put up people put up hosting links, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. So we 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 we've been we've been making sure to check that uh, people what people are uploading are actually the the, the 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 same exact model, so there's no like no virus or anything. Yeah, attached. I see. Got it. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, in my experience, I did I did notice like it's having some lot, some problems co understanding complex instructions, especially yep. if you give like multiple layers. Um, and um, but overall, it's um, quite impressive for something you can run in your MacBook Air. I mean, it's going off on this uh, story right now, <laughs> Trump and Biden. Um, even though I think I said only 300, 200, 300 words, but I think it's yep. like uh, um, going longer. But still, interesting stuff. Um, so let's um let's um dive into um, some of the more um, kind of nitty gritty behind this. So I want to take two angles here. One angle is I want to um, go into kind of what is enabled this day where we could run, you know, this uh, a GPT chat agent on your computer. But second off, I want to go into kind of the bigger picture and what's happening with AI. So first on more the technical side, um, what are the main pieces, I guess, behind, you know, allowing for something like this? Because Obviously, you guys didn't spend years on this. It was like a compilation yep. of pulling lots of things together. Yep. You already mentioned the data piece, right, of um, getting all this output from ChatGPT. Um, you mentioned also the Llama C++, uh, I guess, quantizing you know, the, the file mm -hmm. down. Yep. Um, can you speak to kind of more of the, I guess, did the significance of maybe Facebook's Llama release, yeah, yeah, and yeah. also maybe Stanford's Alpaca release. Did that yeah. have what what significance did those things? Yeah, play? yeah, yeah. So as you said, this thing wasn't wasn't not made in a black box. There's a lot of context around sort of like why this was released now, and also why it was able to be released now. And I think I guess become so viral because uh, it can run on like right CPU. Um, so there's a lot of like, uh, I guess, ingredients that made this possible. Um, the first ingredient is, I guess, the last five years of research in large language modeling. You have these weights that you can pull off the internet that contain stored inside of them, like all of humanity's knowledge that's ever been put on the internet. And like, you can download this thing to your computer right now. And like, you have these weights, like maybe it's a little bit difficult to use them, but like you have humanity's internet on a file. Like that's, <laughs> that's ingredient number one. <laughs> um, Ingredient number two is the fact that, like, to make to be able to make a chatbot like this in a fully reproducible and replicable way, is you need a lot of high quality assistant like chat data, i.e., the kind of interactions you have if you use ChatGPT. Um, and the cool thing is that OpenAI uh, gives you an API to be able to like download and access these things. And they, in their terms of service, they say, "Hey, uh, if you pay us money for this, you own the outputs." Uh, the only thing they sort of prohibit, prohibit is making a model that allows you making a model that will be a large language model competitor to OpenAI. That's explicitly what they say in their terms of service, and that's perfectly kosher. What we did, uh, we're not doing. We're like that's not our intention. That's not our goal. Our goal was to demonstrate to the world that you can make a chatbot assistant uh, by with, with this exact process. We listed out all the exact steps you needed to go in and replicate it, all the way from like this is how you collect the data to like this is how you take the big model that you have trained and put it into a form that can run on CPU uh, on your MacBook. Um, so like, there's. Um, so that's the uh, chat GPT uh, data that you needed to actually um, train the thing and make it to make it feel like a chatbot. The, the model that itself that you're actually training, that's, a, that's that big collection of like the internet's knowledge and a set of weights. Um, the model that you're using right now is the llama model that Meta uh, released, Meta Facebook uh, released um, a couple months back. And that, that model was the sort of the first large it was, it's, not, it's not actually a single model. It's a collection of many models. Uh, we use the smallest of which, um, which is kind of a kind of future direction, right? Uh, we use the smallest of which to train. It's about 7 billion parameters. And it's been trained to basically across the entire internet, predict out the next word given all the previous words that it's seen, for instance, like on a web page or like on a Reddit post or something like this. Um, so the way this whole system works is you take that base model, you take this chat GPT data that we collected, you keep training the model to say, hey, what's the next possible word, but on the data of chat interaction. So like, here's, my, here's the question you asked, this is what chat GPT would have said, we train on that data. And then the model is able to learn to generalize to new types of questions you can ask by, by having the examples of like the style of how a chatbot interacts with a human back and forth. Um, so to do this, there's kind of a, a few technical steps. Um, I'll maybe gloss over them a little bit, but we actually, in, in, in the model that we released, we don't actually train the whole 7 billion parameter 
uh, model, like every single parameter of the model, we train a small subset of it using this uh, machine learning uh, technique called LoRa, low order rank approximation of weights. Um, that just kind of allowed us to do it in a reasonable amount of time and iterate a few times. It took, it took us a few, a few shots of training to actually get this thing to be at the quality that you see right now. Um, we trained about 10 different models over the weekend. Um, and once we had these weights, there was this amazing library that this guy, I don't know where he is based, uh, Georgie, he, um, it's called Llama C++, Llama, Llama .cpp, uh, CPP, yep. Um, and it has about 20,000 stars on GitHub. And it's this amazing function from this big 30 gigabyte collection of weights that you get out when you fine tune uh, the Llama model like we did. Um, to this four gigabyte file on disk that takes each of those weights, which are currently, they're this data type called floating point 16, and, with the, and this applies a process called quantization to it. And each of those weights, instead of being like one of two to the, two to the power of 16 possible numbers, becomes one of, one of 16 possible numbers, which makes the file a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and magically, I guess the other ingredient here is that uh, Apple went and released these like amazing uh, neural engine chips that can take advantage of this sort of like sparsity that you can get by quantizing the model. Um, and then, uh, ba bing ba bang, you have this all these ingredients put together to this box you can run on your on, on your machine or in anyone else's machine, and you can send over and download in ten minutes, and you have a chatbot. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Interesting. So I'm guessing, um, um, with okay, so. In terms of the actual model you used, was it the Llama C++ model then? Or so was that the just the Llama, Llama C++ uh. is the technique that takes the 30 gigabyte Llama Got model mm -hmm. and makes it so that you can run it on your CPU. Um, it, it, it has that fat, it, it has custom code written that makes it really fast to run on your CPU, the end model that gets produced. The base model that we trained on is face, the, the, base, the base model that we use that had the, all of the internet's knowledge on it is called Llama. Uh, it's just okay. called Llama. Um, okay. And that is what that is what you need to start training off from because that that's the thing that can another way to put this is that thing contains all the all the world's knowledge uh, from the internet and then what we do with this training that we do for GPT is we teach it how to access that knowledge in an assistant like manner so that it's so that you can interact with it usefully. Okay, um, did you guys have any problems accessing Llama? I heard it's like only for researchers. So you have to apply for it. Um, yeah, so that model uh, is in order in order to get access to the model, you have to request access from Facebook. Um, okay. We were able to. Uh, I, I believe the machine learning engineer who was working with us uh, was able to somehow get access. I, I'm not exactly sure of mm -hmm. the of the details of of, of that. Uh, but we were doing everything in the spirit of reproducibility and open source. Yeah. Um, that's how uh, I guess m m morally, I don't think it's morally it's not wrong to do this uh, yeah. because we were doing it in the spirit of being able to. Do, reproducibility open source and honestly the fact that these models didn't exist in an open source manner these chatbot like models uh, it kind of says a lot for the ability for people to inspect and play around with the kinds of things you can even do with the models um yeah um alpaca uh, from the yep. stanford researchers like so what did they do to llama i mean if llama yep. already had a seven billion parameter you know yep type so of model, Al then what did they do to add on to that yep a good question so alpaca is Actually, a very, very similar um, process. The way Alpaca was created is a very, very similar process to how GPT for All was created. Um, Alpaca took the same exact base model, the Llama, 7 billion parameter Llama model, and they gathered generations from a different open AI model. It's called Text Da Vinci 3. Uh, and they gathered about 50,000 of these generations. And what the Llama, rather, rather, what the Alpaca model does is you can give it instructions and then it'll give you an answer to the instruction. What it can't do is hold multi-turn conversations like GPT for all can. This is because the data that it was trained on was number one, small. It only had 50,000 data points. And number two, it didn't have, it didn't have samples from chat GPT turbo, which is the assistant like model that you can get that multi-step sort of memory from by training it. You know how you can like, you can write something in GPT for all and then reference in the next message. And it's able to use that reference context from a previous thing you asked it to answer the next message. So, yeah. so with like, for example, with ChatGP, you got some token limit of how much like yep. conversation it could store. What's that with GPT yeah. for all? So it, yeah, it inherits the same one that the Llama, the Llama 7 billion parameter model does. Uh, it's 2,048 2, tokens to the, to the 12. Got it. Yep. Interesting. So, um, yeah. So what, where is this, like, how good can this get? I mean, 
And do you guys have any other aspirations, or are other people kind of coming up yeah, with yeah, ideas yeah, yeah. or running with it? Like, yeah, what's so this, going on here? This is the fun part that I sort of forgot after not doing a major open source contribution for a few years is that once you release something like this and you do a very, very careful, careful, painstaking job to release every portion of the steps to get from like the very start to the very end, all the way from data collection to like the model that you run on your machine and the training in the, that, that, that's, that's in between, we release all this in the GitHub repository. The open source community jumps on it because they see that they can, they can begin building. There's like yeah. hundreds of different things you can do now. Like you can increase more data and potentially get a better model. You can increase the actual model because the bigger the model is, the more um, information that is stored about the internet. Usually these, as these models get larger, uh, they, can, they can do better things. Uh, so you can increase the model and retrain it and maybe you'll have a better chatbot that comes out of that. Um, the other thing that you can do um, that, that this enables you to be able to do is the fact that you can now run this chatbot-like model on a four on, uh, with only four gigabytes of computer memory. You can put it on a device like a Raspberry Pi or like your, your iPhone or Android phone. And you could be your whole, your, your own system. You don't have to send your data to anyone. And you can build over top of it. The one issue with building over top of the current thing that we've released is that the base model is Llama. Llama was released under a certain license called GPL3. GPL3 prevents you from commercializing any derivative works of, whether GPL3 says that any derivative works of the, of, 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 of the Llama model uh, have to also be GPL3, meaning you can't commercialize them. Um, we're actually working on something right now, which is going to remove this requirement. Uh, so in a few days, actually, so this is a, this is a, a little bit of hot tea for you. Mm -hmm. um, we're right now on our GPUs training a model that's Apache 2. So it's completely uh, open source, free to use into any application that you want to put it in with the exact same procedure that would train this model that everyone has right now. And that model, anyone can go to and drop on a Raspberry Pi, drop into any application. We're going to release it completely with free, the whole training procedure, all the data. Um, and you'll be able to use that in anything you want, also commercially. Cool. What model is this? Uh, this model is uh, one of the GPTJ variants. Uh, if you look up GPTJ, uh, it was a model created by a Luther AI. They're, they're sort of like the big open. They're sort of like the original big open source um, community that mm -hmm. began replicating OpenAI's work. Got it. Do yep. you think um, it'll be comparable to? The Llama seven billion parameter model model. Uh, so we've of? we we've already gathered a few samples from the model. It's uh, mm -hmm. about about a fourth of the way, a third of the way through training. And let me let me put it this way. Um, I, uh, I I would be very excited for the end of the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> wow, not, not to like not to like overhype, yeah. but like it's like. Yeah, yeah. It, is it going to be better than the, than the, than the thing everyone's playing with? Uh, it might be comparable, uh, but I think comparable is huge when it means you are yeah, not what, stuck under the non-permissive license. Sure, what you can do with it. Yeah, yep. yeah, fascinating stuff. I mean, th you guys had was it a million um, kind of prompt response? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah let about? me talk about that a little bit. That, that part's actually kind of important. I glossed over it. Mm -hmm. um, so, the biggest thing with training large language models is that if you want to train one that's good. You need high quality, clean data that's curated. Uh, if I had to bet, OpenAI has probably dedicated a substantial portion of resources, millions of dollars, to making sure that the data they train their systems on is extremely high quality. That is, if there's bad examples, they filter out, they don't train on it. Uh, if there's not enough data that has, uh, say, let's say, questions of like a certain variety, so like low data diversity, they'll gather that data and they'll get answers for it to train their chatbot, right? Um, so. High quality curated data is very important, and that's sort of the uh, that's sort of like the route that we took here. Once we gathered this data set, we didn't just like drop like toss it into like the the, the, the model stew and let it churn for a, for a day and like have the model pop out the other end. The first thing we did is we sat down and we cleaned the data. Um, uh, the way we clean the data was we have this like visualization tool. So I, I, I dropped it, just, like, I guess for a little bit more context, I dropped it on my PhD. I work right now at this mm -hmm. startup called Nomic. We build this platform that lets you interactively view and manipulate millions to tens of millions of text documents and images on your computer screen. So if you have like all of Wikipedia, you can see it on one screen and play around with it. We loaded it up into uh, that tool Atlas. Um, and what that allows you to then do is you can see every single data point the model is trained on, on one screen and all the data points that have like bad outputs, they cluster together. Um, and that allowed us to really quickly within, within like an hour, clean the data set out from all the like sort of like misgenerated outputs that ChatGPT gave because sometimes it wouldn't answer the question. Um, and that sort of like what, is what allowed us to very quickly achieve a data set that was uh, what, what we considered high quality. 
Uh, there's still some issues with it, but much better than what we originally started out with. Out, yeah. out with. The data set that we started out with um, was about 1 million uh, questions and then answers from ChatGPT. Uh, after data cleaning uh, through this, this like visual interface, it's really pretty if you want to pull it up later. Um, we turned out with about 400,000 uh, data points that we use in the actual training. Got it. Um, so we really made a strong effort to have clean, clean data in this train. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I guess if you have, you know, a hundred million, let's say, you know, prompt responses, I'm, I'm sure that the, the mod, the model will be much more impressive, you know? Um, yep. Well, then, it's 1 million high quality, clean ones. It'd be sure. much more impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so increase the whole data, I guess you've increased the model size, but then that also probably increase the download, downloadable file size too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there, there, there's, there's, are there's you asking about like future, future directions? Yeah. Like, like how yeah, it okay. can you take so, the next step, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'll let you into sort of whatever our, some of our immediate sort of future directions and I'll yeah. let you in sort of the meta ones that I think the whole AI community will be rallying around the, let me, let me put it this way. The AI yeah. community on, on the industry side will be rallying around. Um, I don't, I don't want to conflate that with what researchers care about, yeah. uh, which is usually not the kinds of things that uh, everyone's freaking out about in, on social media right now, for example. Um, the things that are going to be happening, I think, is number, number one, we were able to demonstrate that by distilling from a large language model API, you can create a, a model that's like it's not amazing, but it's also not bad. Like people are using it, people yeah. are loving using it, and they're able to build it into their system to do useful things. Um, I think this is something about sort of like the future of large language models in that they're going to be democratized. That's like going to be the number one thing. Um, the number two thing is that what happens is when you are able to take these systems and put them on edge devices. An edge device here, for ex means an edge device is relative to like the things the systems these these models are trained on, which are like. Mm -hmm. Uh, gigantic, expensive clusters and GPUs, by putting them on uh, like a MacBook, you get the footprint that you get. You get a, a gigantic increase in the number of people who can utilize them. And as these models get smaller, as the systems to be able to take the big models that you can't run on your computers and transform them into models that you can run on your computers get better, you're going to have these models proliferating onto tons more applications. Um, and I guess the third thing is like a lot of people are like a lot of the people who have been chatting with us after this, they're just very excited about the fact that they've been uncomfortable using these like APIs that OpenAI has, for example, uh, just because they don't want to send their data over. Like their data is like sensitive to them. Um, and they're just excited to be able to have something where they have an alternative. <coughs> problem. Yeah. I mean, like on a, just like a, on a basic level, yep. it's basically you're taking AI, making it so it's basically free. You know, if as long as you have some device that could hold four gigabytes, I mean, I, I guess you need, you know, you have Apple's chips right now, but yep. eventually, you know, in the future, a few years down the road, um, you're you're looking at AI being accessible, right, to to almost anybody at a reasonable cost, or basically almost free. And what does that do to knowledge, education, just you know, the power of that intelligence? Sure, there's different levels of large language models and how, you know, what you can do with it. But on a base level, you know, you can at least access something, you know, of AI that could help with, you know, maybe teaching your kids, maybe you're in a rural village or something without anything, you know, without internet connection at all, you know, <laughs> and you get this magic, you know, whatever Raspberry Pi device yep. and, you know, it's like hundred bucks, something it has the latest, you know, whatever model you can run on this thing and educate your, your entire village. It's like crazy, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. the potential, definitely. Yeah, yeah, this sort of reminds me, I have, um, I, I, I met a guy a few a few months ago who his whole thing was he would make these Raspberry Pis, um, they, they make these devices based on Raspberry Pis, that he would upload all of Wikipedia to them and then send mm -hmm. them to villages in like, in like uh, third world countries. Um, and this would, and this would like allowed an amazing new avenue for people to be able to like basically get educated because they don't even have internet access in those areas. But now you have something where you can like have access to the whole world of knowledge. And I think the same sort of thing is going to start happening um, within the next few years when it comes to like AI systems. You have these little boxes which you can send a query and it gives you an output. And maybe some, sometimes that output is wrong. Maybe sometimes yeah. it's not factual. Uh, but that output is in general going to allow people to be more creative. That output is in general going to allow, as the systems get better, allow people to have access to more factual knowledge about the world. Mm -hmm. um, like, there's a lot of issues to overcome. Like, this is not like a pan like uh, like panacea, right? But like, 
what's going to happen is people are going to realize that these systems are not going away and they're going to want to live with them. Um, it's, it's like any other technology. It's going to, prolif- it's going to proliferate. The technology is not going to stop getting better. It's not going to stop getting smaller. Um, you're going to see these sort of agents exist in probably all parts of your life. Um, they'll exist in good ways. There'll probably be some bad things that happen because of them. Like this next election might be pretty scary, uh, especially with like, like this comp- compared with like image, this, this paired with like image generation AI, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but like with anything, like technology is, has good outcomes, has good, ba- has bad outcomes. But in general, I think humanity will learn to, learn to, learn to deal with it and be better for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting, I guess we could segue into more of this bigger picture yeah. um, thing going on. So, you know, we're in this amazing kind of development stage for AI where we're just seeing explosion, ex- explosive growth uh, in the past, you know, say six to 12 months across so many different areas, not just text, but image, um, um, vision, so much other stuff. Yep. And um, the, the world is now awakening to the rival of, you know, AI to make its grand entrance. And there are, you know, on one side, a ton of people saying, oh my gosh, this is going to positively impact society in amazing ways, right? With healthcare, you know, um, disease, um, cures, education, all sorts of stuff, you know, productivity, economy. But, and then there's another side where people are alerting people to the dangers, right? And you're saying how we, you think that generally people will, will figure it out, will learn to live with it. Um, some good, some bad. Um, I guess in this bigger picture, um, it seems like you're leaning kind of more to be on the optimistic side, right? You're saying, hey, we'll get through this, right? And I, mean, I guess like, my- if you're, not, if you're not optimistic, then yeah. <laughs> it's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to pose a couple kind of just sure. um, uh, kind of questions for thought or questions I want to hear your more optimistic sure. view on. What happens when AI gets like so powerful, it can basically almost hack into almost anything that's hackable, let's say. Um, and it's the primary means of warfare between countries. And you have the biggest, let's say, AI most capable, let's say not just next year, but let's say 10, 15 years down the road, used to basically you know, access and manipulate, control, infiltrate other you know, networks in other countries to basically play this AI warfare game, right? Um, mm-hmm. Where this becomes like the, this is the power yeah. for nations, right? Is their power yeah. of their AI. And whoever has the strongest AI becomes the most powerful. You can basically cripple a whole country down to almost nothing. Yeah. I mean, right? this is, this is um, already happening, right? Like, yeah, there's, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, in the past, it, there has been, of course, you know, governments doing this already. There's a precedent of, you know, governments getting into systems and, and doing this type of no, warfare. No, no, I, but, mean, I mean, like AI um, systems are already doing this. Sh- sure, sure. But well, I'm saying this is going to escalate to, you know, to uh, in a lot of ways as AI, mm-hmm. you know, grows yeah. in its power. Um, why would a government let, I guess, the most powerful AIs in that scenario be out of its own control? Meaning, why wouldn't government try to regulate in a way where for its own safety and protection kind of cripple AI so it can be safe, right? It doesn't get taken over by an AI. So therefore crippling the AIs that corporations and humans have access to, but allowing their own AI unlimited power to exercise dominance over other countries for so-called national security. Like what's, what am I, what's in that scenario? What, what's going on? How, what's the optimistic take you think on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, if, if, if I like jump j- j- jump the trail of hypotheticals correctly, yeah. um, and this is the, this is my answer will be in response to all of that. Um, I think in that situation, like like that's that sounds very dystopian, right? Um, and like it's 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 certainly a real outcome that might possibly happen, but I think there's other likely outcomes that the world can be in. Um, like I, I, I do like to be honest. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know how to answer the question of like what, what, what's going to be happening into the world in the world when that exists. Um, but like I have seen a lot of it already. Like, for example, these things that people call troll farms are not like a bunch of people sitting around nowadays, like like flooding the social media channels of other countries to attempt to sway like elections and all this stuff. There's a large language models doing it. And these language models, as they get better, are going to be able to sway, like, I don't know, your grandma who's staring at her at, at, at the phone that she just got. Like, she doesn't know the difference between 
something that a real person posted or a large language model posted. And they're going to be more and more swayed to like think in ways that are aligned by like the actors who are like, who have these models and these actors are probably going to be governments or people aligned with governments. And like, yeah, I mean, these are like, these are terrible things that are happening and, but people there's, there's active communities of people who are trying to like prevent the, this sort of worst case scenario outcome from occurring. Um, there is a huge, huge community of very, very talented, very, very smart uh, people doing AI safety. Um, one large language modeling company, actually, uh, I don't know if you heard of them, it's called Anthropic. They're sort of kind of, their kind of whole thesis is sort of built around this. Um, like, if, if the rate of change continues at the pace that it's going at now, uh, we, the, the likelihood of a scenario that you described is very possible. What can we do now? Uh, when we have a bunch of funding, we have the smart people who can train these models, who can uh, teach them how to not do bad things. Um, what can we do now uh, to sort of prevent this or mitigate, or mitigate the potential possible outcomes? Um, and, and Anthropic as a, as a company, I think, so they, they originally were started by some open AI engineers who saw what was happening. Like when these systems first came out, they left the company and they started building this. Um, so there's a lot of people who are trying to prevent it, but I think the sort of hypothetical situation you described, I mean, it just sounds terrible. Um, mm -hmm. like I, I, I personally have been like, like I, I'm Ukrainian, for example. I, I personally have been affected by tons of Russian propaganda flooding into the country that I'm from mm -hmm. and like causing havoc internally in it. Like it, it's a very real thing. It's scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's going to open up definitely a lot of different um, challenges and questions. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, where do you think, I mean, AI is progressing so fast. What are you like most um, interested in? What, what do you think is most significant in terms of the bigger kind of trends and, and things happening AI? For example, if someone is just, let's say a lay person is saying, I want to know what's going on, what's going to be happening in the next six or 12 months, what should I keep my eyes focused mm -hmm. on? What yep. would you so how, how, do you look through the, how do you look through the noise that everyone yeah, is like exactly. deep inside right now? Yeah. Um, I think like the, bro the broad strokes of what's occurring right now are the following. Um, AI systems, the second you see a really good one, there's likely going to be a version that's maybe not as good, but comparable, that's going to be way more accessible and easily easy to use. I think that's a bet you can, I, I, I would stand put, put my money behind. Um, the next thing is that these systems will proliferate all parts of your life. Um, and you're going to have to learn to live with it. Um, that's going to be definitely a thing. Um, and I guess the third thing I would say here is if you're somebody who's sitting right now, like seeing like, like in October, you're going about your life. This like chat GPT thing comes out in November. And now it seems like everything around you is like, this, 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 this system is existing and everything around you and students are using it to cheat on their high school uh, homework assignments and college students and like professors in college are freaking out because they can't detect plagiarism in like 100 level classes. Like, like it seems to be in every single part of society. Like, how do you react? How do you, how do you look through that noise to figure out what's going to happen next? Um, well, I think, I think really what you, what you want to get, like, in my opinion, the thing that makes these systems work so well is the, well, some of it's my opinions, obviously based on like facts, is what makes these systems work really well is when the systems get scaled and when they get scaled larger to more data. And there's some sort of like caveats with scaling larger to more and to, to more data, but this is going to be a, an active like pursuit that a lot of organizations that are well-funded are going to take on. Um, there's this new AI chip coming out called the H100, um, named after uh, computer scientist uh, Grace Hopper. Um, and the H100 is this AI chip that has the ability to train the base neural network that uh, like powers like a chat GPT, uh, like natively, like, like carved into the chip, basically. And it's on back order for like a year and a half out now. Um, you, 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 can, you can read all about it online. Um, and this is the, the bottleneck right now to making these large models bigger and presumably better once they get bigger and trained on more data is the fact that there's literally not the silicon in existence right now <laughs> minted into these chips to be able to allow these models to get trained larger. So that's definitely going to be something that occurs. Um, people have these things on back order. Uh, these models will be trained on them. And we will likely see systems that are not just like text, like put in a piece of text, get text out or put in a piece of text, get an image out, or put an image, get text out, you'll see systems where you can take in any data modality, uh, text, image, video, audio, get any data modality out. Um, eventually, 
maybe these systems will be able to like do multi-step reasoning and this sort of thing across these modalities. And like, p people are actively working on building these sort of things on the research side. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. have any um, hot take on uh, Apple, what they, what they might do? I mean, they've got their WWDC developer conference coming up. They've got like, you know, these amazing chips and hardware in their devices. Like they could release a local, you know, kind of model or they could, you know, do something more in the cloud, like a chat GPT competitor. Do you think they're equipped? Do you think they're able to do something, pull this off, like, and run with, you know, some of the fastest ones out there or yeah. what's your take? Um, I don't know. A Apple is always, the Apple has never been first to the party, but they have consistently been best to the party after a while. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anything behind uh, Apple as an org. Uh, I have a few friends who work at Apple and I've asked these sort of same questions to them. And uh, they do a really good job of telling their engineers to keep their mouth shut. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say that, like, I, I would not put it behind Apple. Like, the, the reason they have developed this inference, en inference engine that they've put into everything from, like, their phones to their laptops and, I guess, eventually to all the other edge devices that they have, like the smartwatches, is because they want to be able to run neural networks on them in real time. And when I say neural networks, I mean all of the previous systems that we've talked about, like text to text, text to image, so on and so forth. Um, it is 100% on Apple's roadmap to have these sort of agents embedded in all their products. I would, mm -hmm. I would probably wager. <laughs> yeah. But what's going to yeah. come up at the, at the next conference? I mean, I don't know. Who, who knew iPhone was going to drop the, the next conference in 2006, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so we've got this situation. It seems like open AI is kind of in the lead with not just chat, ChatGPT or 3.5, but now Chat or GPT-4. And that was like six months ago, they, they finished their base model. You know, they did six months of alignment. So they're working already on their next thing, probably. Mm -hmm. um, what are the chances of people catching up and who can catch up? Um, I mean, there's like yeah. different, yeah, there's different, there's different levels of catching up, right? Like if mm -hmm. your goal is to have a system like, let's say like GPT-4 that is aligned to do, to like, do good things and not answer you when you want to do something bad is highly factual can do like this sort of like multi-hop assistant reasoning um like it's hard to catch up to that because open ai has based their like multi multi-billion dollars of investment around getting the high quality data getting the sort of top engine top brass in the industry uh mm -hmm. huge bleed has come from pretty much every company to open ai over the last few years so they have a, they have a large head start um but the other thing that they have but the other thing that that i guess is going for everyone else is that it seems that it's easier than some people would imagine to use the outputs of these models to make your own models. Um, and we did this in a small, at a small scale, completely for like open science, reproducibility research, just kind of to demonstrate that it was possible. Um, I am 100% certain there are other organizations doing the same thing. In fact, if you actually check the news for today uh, around OpenAI and Google's BARD model, you will find that the Bard model allegedly did the same thing we did. <laughs> I read that they. I think the article, one of the articles, the same. They they took stuff from shared GPT website. And, yes, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is the output of Chat GPT. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of it's kind of sad too. The um the 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 person who sort of announced this uh, was actually the lead author on this paper called BERT, B E R T which was sort of like one of these original papers that, so, that showed that you can make computers do interesting things with human language. He was like the lead author on this paper, Dev, uh, last name Devlin. And uh, he's the one who did this and then he left the team. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know, it's a little spicy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think um, Elon Musk has a chance with his, um, I think it's called based AI, what he's doing, um, trying to put together a competitor to ChatGPT? Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I honestly don't have enough like, context on what 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 he what he's doing with this to really answer that question truthfully uh but also like i wouldn't put much past him be like making a bet that he can't do something is probably foolish <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah got it um yeah fascinating stuff um i i it's um it's cool that you you guys like uh, release this and you're able to get the do you know how many times it's been downloaded um the project um, or so 
I, I know how much money we 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 I know how much money we spent. So it, let's Here's put it this S3. way: at least at least fifteen thousand based on while it was being hosted in our servers, and some like good Got members it. of the open source community didn't didn't host it somewhere else based on the yeah. money that we have to cough up to Amazon now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to think about tens of thousands of people running, you know, this AI agent on their local computer. I yeah. I actually like turned off my Wi-Fi and and showed my kids like this is all just on my computer right now you know four gigabytes and just tossing out all these you know questions yep. um yeah it's definitely um it's almost like a paradigm shift you know before our local machines were kind of i, I wouldn't say dumb machines but they weren't like intelligent machines you had to connect to the internet to get information search you know all this stuff but you know it's, it's kind of odd feeling the first 10 minutes of yeah. of being disconnected to the internet, but actually getting like what it feels like internet, like data or, you know, like real interesting answers to your real questions. Um, so it just seems like the start of something really, really fascinating. No, it, it is, it is. This, this yeah. edge paradigm is something mm -hmm. I'm personally super excited about. Um, actually, so some, of the, some of our initiatives at, at Nomic is basically putting all of our AI systems uh, on the edge. Uh, so mm -hmm. in the browser without having to send any external API calls, because you can actually have uh, like more pleasant experiences with these models. For instance, as you're going through and using like a website, there will be an actual agent running in Google Chrome browser that is able to use uh, that's it's able to do the kinds of things that you could do with the, with the APIs right now. And there oh, there are hackers fur furiously burning midnight oil to make these things come into existence right now. It's yeah, exciting. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be interesting also because you open sourced it, and you just didn't open source it. You actually detailed all of the steps that yep. you guys took. And what I was actually in, uh, impressed by, you actually detailed um, the exact steps you guys took to collect the data, <laughs> like all of the, the different, like everything basically. Yep. And so I'm like, wow, it really gives, you know, people a chance to, to, to try something with it, you know, and actually, you know, yeah. do something interesting. Yeah, the, the, the goal here was, the reason I started this whole project, like I said, was because I read that paper, saw they didn't have a method section, and it kind of irked me a little bit. So yeah. the goal here was to basically be a compliment to everything that happened in there. <laughs> yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where to leave out, yeah, the method section to kind of take this, this turn where OpenAI is saying, um, we can't tell you much now about this model. You know, they're not even, yeah, they're just, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, and I guess your response is, hey, let's, you know, make something accessible. Um, and um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, this is fascinating stuff. I um, want to thank you for your time, Andre, and just uh, being generous and sharing your thoughts and on your project and the future of AI. Um, it's definitely something I'm sure um, my audience and myself will be following. Um, how can people kind of uh, keep up to date with what you're doing? I'll go yeah. ahead and uh, link to your Twitter profile. Um, your startup is Nomic, right? Yep. Is it nomic.ai? Is that no, no, Nomic AI? Yep. AI. Okay. Yep. And I'll link to the GitHub uh, GPT for all project as well. Is there anything else you want to plug um, before we wrap up? Here? Um, I, the biggest thing is if, if you go into the if you go into the GitHub, all the resources should be there. Uh, look out for the newest model that we're dropping that you can actually run uh, on your systems commercially. Uh, it's, uh, G based on GPTJ, So it's on the same licenses. Uh, we have a discord in there as well. If you want to join the chatter. So, yeah. Got it. Um, actually before we go, I, I wanted to, to, um, do this one thing because I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some people who, um, who are curious about how to install this thing. Yep. Um, and they might not be technically oriented. They might not even know GitHub. And so I just want to, just quickly, you go to this website. So this is the website you'll you'll go to. It's a GitHub uh, nomic ai gpt for all. Then you'll go to code, and you'll just download the zip file like that. Um, and it'll start downloading. And then after that, you'll go down to this section here. Um, oh, you guys changed the the instructions a bit. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Step yeah, one, link. yeah. So you basically just like. Uh, you download this file um, right here, um, and that's different than the, the zip file. So you download, this is the four gigabyte quantized uh, model here. Um, and then uh, you'll basically, you'll open up your terminal, and then you'll navigate to this chat folder, and then type in this command. Yeah, okay. the chat folder is in, in, that, in that file you downloaded. Yeah, 
in, yeah, in, in so, the uh, zip file. Yeah. So for those who don't know how to navigate on terminal, basically just open up terminal app on your, you have to have a MacBook um, that has a M1 or M2 chip, right? Um, so you can run this. So oh, you could do it on yeah, the Windows. open source community oh, you could do. Went, went in and compiled it. it for everything else. So it, for everything else. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Does it just run slower, let's say, like on a Yes, yeah. A Mac so it'll, it'll run, it, it runs Windows. fast on the Macs because it's specifically compiled for Got the inference engine. But. Okay. Got it. And then, yeah, to, to navigate to the folder, you'll just do, you know, CD, look it up on Google how to navigate to a folder, but it's just basically type in CD and the name of the folder and you can navigate to it. And you just run it and you'll be up, up and running in like, um, in like a minute or two after you've downloaded the file and you'll have a, this AI agent on your... Um, on your computer, crazy times we're living in. <laughs> Definitely historical. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right, Andre, take care. Thanks for chatting. We'll talk Dave, later. Thank you so much. All right. I'll see you. Bye.